Last of all, I want to thank uh, Mary and uh, for asking me to present something at the school. Um, I also want to thank Nam and for his hospitality here and picking up, picking me up from the Kanazawa, uh, John and Anyway, so on the topic today is, you know, so this is using belief function theory in practice for graphical belief function models. So we build models, very large models with many variables. Of course, um, we want to, in practice, as is people say, you know, density shifter is intractable. You can't do large models. This is not true. <laughs> you can you can solve as large as models as large as you want. Um, so I'll also talk about uh, computation and applications. Um, so that's the goal today. So an outline. So basically, I'll start with the. So everything. So you know, there are many theories of uh, uncertainty. It's like uh, like Terry mentioned, there's possibility theory, and there is density for probability. And there are other theories also, like Spohn's epistemic beliefs. They all have a structure. So for me, because I understand probability very well, so. Anything in probability, I can transfer to belief functions by using this notion of evaluation. So I'll talk about the, the notion of evaluation-based systems. This is an, an abstraction that allows you to transfer knowledge from. If you know one, you can understand the other one also. And I, again, the basics here are pretty, Terry has done a very good job uh, with the basics, but I will talk about further things. So static is a representation. We talked about belief, uh, plausibility, Commonality and stuff like that. And dynamic is, is tensors rule. And there's also uh, a rule for finding marginals. So I'll talk about those two. And then I will talk about further things notion of independence, which we need for graphical models, uh, and what, what constitutes conditionals. So, unfortunately, in, in practice, um, conditionals have been defined backwards. Start with the join and define conditionals. But in graphical models, we construct the join from the conditions. So we need a definition of conditionals. That doesn't depend on the joint. It's called backwards. So in you know in Bayesian networks you have this conditional probability tables. So this is what conditions are for belief functions. And I'll talk about you know uh, graph uh, directed models like like Bayesian networks and and undirected models like Markov networks and probability theory. Because a large part we talk about you know how do we compute? How do we make inferences from these models? I call it local computation because you can compute marginals of the joint without actually computing the joint, which cannot be computed because mod the models are too big. You actually can't compute the joint. So the joint exists in theory, and we can compute uh, the marginals without actually computing the joint. But I'll talk about a few uh, few examples here. These are actually, Captain's problem is from um, Russell Almond's book. Um, chess clinic is from Lorison Spiegel Order. And communication network is from Hani Lehman's paper in each app. That's sort of the. I don't know, references are all in the end. So I don't I don't them I don't have them on the video slide. Okay, so let's start. Um, so a valuation-based system is a is sort of an abstract framework for representing a reasoning with knowledge. It has two parts. A static part is concerned with representation, a dynamic part is concerned with reasoning. So the static part I will talk about. So um, but here you talked about refining. And so basically we, we have we have variables. And so, so the joint is actually the, the Cartesian product of, of all the variables. Each time you have a new variable, you have a new a new refinement of the state space. Okay. You can make your state space as, as refined as you want. And then we have uh, so this is the, the value valuations are actually belief functions. Okay. So we have we have uh, a knowledge. So each valuation tells us something about a group of variables. Okay. So finite set of valuations. So each, for example, row row will tell us something about uh, R. R is a subset of variables, and so on and so forth. So my notation is I have capital letters will, will denote variables, subsets will denote by the lowercase letters R, S, T, etc. And uh, no, I will use this Greek symbols for for actually the functions themselves. So each row, for example, will tell us something is knowledge about uh, it's it's uh, we'll say row is a valuation for R, so where R is a subset of variables. 
And then we have a graphical representation of the whole thing. It can be, we'll use a new, a new representation called valuation network. I'll give you an example. So here is a, so my graphical model here is, you know, has, has, has these variables, arrival delay, departure delay, forecasted weather, loading delay, et cetera. And at the bottom here is the, are, are the, uh, the valuations, what we know about. So alpha tells us something about arrival delay, departure delay, and sailing delay. Okay, so in this example, uh, arrival delay is sum of departure delay and sailing delay. So, so that is, so these are all the, all the knowledge about these things. And it's like, think of this as a bipartite graph where, you know, we have edges only between the two, two possible graphs. So the dynamic part, um, I talked about the, the static part. So we have, value, we, have, we have variables and valuations. The dynamic part has, so we have a combination operator. How do you combine knowledge? So this allows us to uh, aggregate knowledge and in, in, in the DS theory, Dempster's rule is, is the combination operator. And this and has, has the following properties, right? So we need some, you know, to impose some discipline so we can do some, some things, <laughs> compute marginals. So we, the domain, let's see, the domain XM says if rho is a valuation for R and sigma is a valuation for S, and I combine them and, and they're distinct. So this is important. When you combine things, you want to combine things that are independent, you can just combine arbitrarily. So I will emphasize that rho and R, then if I combine this to rho O plus sigma will be, will give us a valuation for R unionness. When you combine things, the space gets bigger, okay? And I, uh, so we require that the, when I combine uh, this combination operator is commuted, it doesn't really matter, you know, whether you combine rho plus sigma or sigma plus sigma, it's the same thing. And it's also associated. So it doesn't matter in, in what sequence you combine them. So anyway, so covered, so in general, rho, rho plus rho is not rho. So we should be careful. Rho O plus rho is not rho, I mean, unless it's identical. But in general, it's not. It's, so we have to be careful about uh, not to double count non-idempotent knowledge. Okay, non-idempotent knowledge is things that doesn't satisfy this. Idempotent knowledge is where you can combine things like uh, deterministic knowledge uh, is idempotent, so it doesn't really matter. But if it's non-idempotent, we should we should not combine it. So we should only combine distinct valuations. This is all in words what I'm saying here. The sequence in which knowledge is combined makes no difference. Uh, the combination of all valuations, I'll call it the joint. So I put an O plus of all, all my valuations, I call it the joint valuation. As I said, in practice, we can't compute this. So we can, we can talk about this, okay? Uh, in large models, the number of variables is large. The joint cannot be explicitly computed. okay? So we need an, a, another operator. It's called uh, marginalization. Basically, it allows us to, this operator minus X, starting from this, will give us a knowledge that has, has less variables in it, <laughs> one less variable in it, okay? It allows us to coarsen knowledge by removing X out of the domain of knowledge. So we require, again, some properties. So if rho is a valuation for R and X is an R, X is a variable in R, and rho minus x will be a, a valuation for r minus x. Okay, this is set minus. Uh, this axiom says order does not matter. So it doesn't, if rho is a valuation for r and x and y are both in r, then if I first remove x and then y, I get the same answer as if I first remove y and then x. Okay. So since it doesn't make a difference, we just represent it by minus x, y. And finally, so this is really important. So this, this axiom is deals with both combination and margin, marginalization. We call it the local computation. And basically this axiom says, let's see. So rho, rho is a valuation for R and sigma is a valuation for S. And if X is only in R and X is not in S, I want to remove R from my joint, then I don't need to compute the joint, I'm saying, since X is only in R, I can actually just marginalize rho, okay? 
and then add fix. So this combination is a lot cheaper than this. So this is on the space of R union S, and this module is, is only on the space of R. Okay. So whatever theory we do, it's important that we satisfy this. Otherwise, we can't do the we can't do whatever I've had to do. So this uh, unfortunately is satisfied for belief functions. It satisfies that for, for probability, it satisfies for possibility, etc. So my other thing is, so when I, uh, this, this notation here, sometimes when I want to talk about what is being removed, I use this minus notation. When I want to talk about what's left, I will talk about, I use the down arrow. So down arrow tells me what's left and the minus tells me what is being removed okay, when, I, when I marginalize. So feel free to ask questions, okay? Um, so what does it make, what does it mean to make inference? So we have a model, we want to make inference. Basically, we want to find marginals of the joint for the variables of interest. So you have a very large model. You have, you know, in a medical domain, you have symptoms. Uh, you know, you have diseases. You have um, risk factors, etc. So eventually, you want to ask the question: Does this patient suffer from this particular disease? Okay. So you want to remove everything from except that disease. Find the marginal of the joint. And you include all the all your observations and and so on. So on. Okay. So thus, if X is a variable of interest, we, we want to find, this is the joint knowledge. I want to sort of marginalize it to X, okay? Re remove everything else, or this is the notation. I remove all, all the other variables. Okay. I'm marginalizing all variables, D minus X out of the joint. This is what it means to make inference. Okay. Um, so as I said, this is an abstraction of, several uncertainty calculi, like proposition of calculus with no uncertainty, uh, probability, belief functions, cons epistemic belief, possibility, et cetera. And it also it can also be, you can also use this abstraction for other things like optimize, optimization. <laughs> so dynamic program, for example, we want to, we have objective functions. Um, uh, we have, um, you can think about max, you want to find the maximum of an objective function that factorizes. So the combination will be how you factorize it multiplicatively, additively, and, and maximizing a variable corresponds to doing, uh, doing marginalization. And so on. So they can also be used for Bayesian decision theory, solving systems equations, the relation database. So let me come, come to this BS theory. Um, so in DS theory, we represent knowledge by using what um, theory called mass function. I use Schaeffer's terminology. It's basic probability assignment, simply BPA is a mass function. Okay, M, and that is belief function, plausibility, commonality. So any one is you know. So in practice, we we use M most of the time in practice. And of course, the dynamic part is we we have Dempster's rule of combination, which is the product intersection rule, or by Followed by normalization, uh, and that is that is a rule for finding marginal. I don't think you talked about it. Maybe you did. Special case of course. restriction. Yes, yes, yes. And of course, I talked about inference. So, given a set of belief functions, I'd like to find the marginals of the joint for some represent, and the joint is obtained by combining everything you know. Okay. So this is. This is just a repetition. I, I only do it for, for BPAs. So we have a B is a finite set of variables. For each variable X, uh, we have a state space. So what theory called the frame of discernment. I simply call it a state space omega X, which tells you the possible values of that of X. And for every non-empty subset S, the I know the state space of S will be omega S will be the Cartesian product of omega X or X in S. So I'll talk about omega s as the states of the variables in s. And this is, of course, the power set. And a, a basic probability assignment for a mass function of zero mass on the empty set and sum of all masses um, has to add to one. And the subsets for which the mass is strictly positive, really called focal set, but I call it focal element. This is using Schaeffer's terminology. <laughs> I, Schaefer was a colleague of mine, and we worked together for many years. So I'm probably used to using his terminology. 
That's my spirit. So the, the you know, Perry talked about the uh, Dempster's rule, which Dempster himself called the product intersection rule, because you assign the product of the masses to the intersection of the, the focal elements, or by normalization. Uh, in general, M plus M is not M. So when you combine M1 and M2 by Dempster's rule, you want to make sure they're distinct. So in graphical model, this is important because you have a lot of lot of many functions. A lot of you want to make sure they're distinct. So the question is, what does that mean? I'll talk about it. And Dempster's rule satisfies, you know, I, I impose some 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 properties, and Dempster's rule satisfies that property. If M1 is a BPA for S1, M2 is for S2, then M1 plus M2 will be a BPA for S1. Union S2, just by definition of the Dempster's rule, is commutative and it's associated. Um, so marginalization for belief function is that just like probability, you have, we find marginals, you write them on the margin by adding all the probabilities. We do this something similar here. So basically, I need to talk about, uh, let's see, we have sets. Uh, we have sets, so basically, uh, I will talk about Rejection of states. If A is a state of omega s, I want to, and x is a variable in s, and I want to sort of remove x from A, so bring it down, I want to bring it down, or A minus x. So it's a state of s obtained by just dropping. We just drop the states. Okay. All this, we just drop the states of x. Um, yeah. So if I take x, y, and I want to find its projection to x, then we just x and move everything else. If I have a subset, then I do the same thing. So if I if A is a subset of S and I, A uh, raised to minus x will be, or A down to S minus x is basically, I just set of all Bs, B minus x where B is in A, okay. I'll do some examples. And so if M is a BPA for S and x is a variable in S, and I find the marginal m to the minus x, this will be a BPA for s minus x, where I, 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 I add them up. This is the addition part for all m of b that I get that will result in when I drop uh, x from a. Okay, so all, all, the, all the a's, all, all the b's where b minus x is a. Okay, so I'll do an example here. Here's an example of, of marginalization. Let's say so M is a variable with, with the state space true or false for M, and R is a state space uh, true or false for R. And here we have a mass function. Uh, you know, this there are three, three objects here out of four. There's another three objects out of four, it's 0.7, this is 0.2. So I want to sort of drop M, M from this, this mass function. This is a mass function for M and R. So basically, so basically, if I drop, uh, if I drop M, right? So here I get uh, this becomes R. This is TR, and this is FR. So basically, it's TR FR gets 0 0.1, and from here, if I drop uh, M, I get FR TR FR. So basically, FR TR. This also goes to uh, TR FR, and this, of course, is everything. So it's marginal. So basically, I get everything. So basically, the marginal of this. Is, is a vector's belief function. Okay. So here I have some knowledge. And when I marginalize it, I get a vector's belief function. So, so this tells me nothing by itself. It doesn't tell me anything about, about R. Similarly, if I if I marginalize this to M, I remove R from it. But the same logic, you know, if I remove R, this is TM and FM. So this go, this point one goes to TM FM. If I drop this TM FM, so this also goes to TM FM and this also goes to TM. So basically. It is a piece of knowledge that tells me nothing, nothing individually about R or M. <laughs> okay. So M by itself tells us nothing about either M or R. So this is not the one. Of course, this definition that I just gave you satisfies um, the domain. So the domain axiom says if M is a PPA for R and X, is, X belongs to R, then when I remove X, I get a mass function for R minus X. The order does not matter. The order in which I drop, when I'm dropping more than one, it doesn't matter. And finally, importantly, it satisfies this local computation axiom. Okay. So I'm removing X and X is only an R. I can just, I can do this locally. If we're doing this, I can do that. Okay. 
Okay, so I want to talk about graphical models. I need this notion of independence. So I thought I'd start with probability because I, I assume all of you know about probability. Um, so here is a, a definition. There are many definitions of independence, but they're all equivalent. So if you think about um, um, irrelevance, right? If, so we can say X and Y are conditionally independent given Z. If given Z, X and Y are irrelevant to each other. This also, uh, uh, here I'm using, you know, the factorization of the joint. So if, if R, X and Y, F, X and Y are independent given Z, that means the joint for X, Y, Z factors into, so this is, this is what this is. So the, um, if P is a joint distribution for V for all of N, R, S, P, R, this, so this joint subsets are V. We say R and S are conditionally independent given P with respect to P. So notation is I use this notation for independence with respect to P. So R is independent of S given P. If the joint, if the marginal of the joint for R and S and T factors into a potential for R union T and a potential for S union T. So whatever is given is common to both of these. Okay. Um, and this is what I just said. So this is sort of the definition of conditional independence. Okay. So if I if I did if I did this what what you're used to, I think you'll be I mean, you know, um so R is independent given P of S given T. We can have um P um P down to R unit S. So P, so for example, R, then we have um, P of R given T and P of S. So one, one, one definition is something like that, right? Given T, R is independent of S. Basically, we can do something like that. And then we, so we maybe want P of okay. So this is, you can think of this and this as R and T and this and this as, uh, the case domain is S and T. So what this is then um this is one definite one of the many definitions of of condition this is for probability so I, I will do the same thing for for um belief functions so this is the definition that i provided in in my 94 paper in EJAR. the title is conditional independence for validation based systems um so if m is a bpa for v so this is think of the thing of m as a joint and R, S, T are disjoint subsets of V. We say R and S are conditionally independent given T with respect to M. I write it in the same way. R is independent of S given T with respect to M. If the marginal of the joint for R, S, T is equal to some belief function for R union T and some belief function for S union T. Where M, R union T is the BPA for R union T, M, S union T is for S union T, and, and these are distinct. And my comment here is there are several, this is not the only definition given. Um, there are a few other definitions by Philippe and its uh, Tunisian students, um, Ben Yaglan, Melon. Yeah. But they're different. But this is what is important to us in graphical models. Graphical models give you a factorization of the joint. <laughs> That's what we need. This is the definition you need. And the nice thing about this definition is all the definitions of graphical models and probability translate to belief functions. So I don't need to sort of explain my definitions. They all come from probability. Okay. And not only that, so in this paper, I show that uh, like in probability theory, the, this definition of, of conditional dependence satisfies the graphoid properties, not just semi-graphoid, also graphoid properties of conditional dependence. So this is exactly what we need. Okay. Um, and this is, of course, uh, shown in, in this paper here. Okay. So now I want to talk about condition. What, what are conditionals, right? I want to define conditionals without actually starting from the joint. I don't want to define a conditional as joint divided by the marginal. So we don't have a joint. <laughs> we start with, so in, in, in building graphical models, we, we build them using conditions. Or directed models. So, 
So this is defined in a recent paper by Radim uh, Vashlik and I. So here's the definition. Um, so in probability, we construct Bayesian networks by using CPTs, conditional probability tables. So the question is, what is the analog of this probability functions? So here is the sort of the definition. Suppose R and S are disjoint subsets of, of variables, uh, and I will assume that R prime is could be a subset of R. It could be a strict subset. So I'll tell you why I do this. Um, so BPA M R prime given S for R prime union S is a conditional BPA for R prime given S, if and only if. So if I take this conditional and I, you know, I think about R prime as the head and S the tail, right? So if I if I if I remove the head of the conditional, I get vacuous. So if you take if you think of a a, a CPD table for X given something else, if I remove X from it, I get a table with all ones in it. <laughs> Is vacuous, so that's uh, so. This is a vacuous. And the second condition is also important for me. So if M R is the BPA for R, and M R and M R prime, given as this this conditional are distinct, then then I can combine those two and get a BPA for R union S. Okay. So that, the reason I had you know if if R prime is the same as R. I'm not. I'm not making any assumptions of independence. <laughs> but in general, when I, you know, I can't build the graphical models by having everything. I, I can't start with x and then y given x and then z given x and y and w given x y z x. So I end up with a complete model, and you don't have a model. If you have a complete graph. You don't have a model because you can't do anything with it. For me, it's a non-model. So typically, we build models by not having complete things. So so basically. Now this this things. What does it mean for this to be distinct? So I okay. Let me see my terminology. I will call R the head of the conditional R prime here, and S will be the tail. So in the second condition here, distinct means that. Uh, so this will be easier if I this um, M R and M R R prime given S are distinct. If and only if um, what I is so S so so given R prime, so I'm leaving out I'm leaving out uh, stuff in R minus R prime. That's because they're conditionally independent. So basically, with, with, with respect to the joint, S is conditionally independent of what I leave out. Okay, so if I have a graphical model. Um, So I have uh, X pointing to Y pointing to people. So if I do this, right, if I do this, then there's no independent zone. Okay. But if I leave this out, I'm assuming, if I leave this out, I'm assuming, you know, Y is, so this conditional here, so I have P of X, I have P of Y given X here, and I have P of Z given Y here. Okay. So when I do this, I'm leaving out X, I'm assuming that you know, given y, x, z is independent of x. Okay. So otherwise, if, if, if I assume independence method that that is, and then I'm double counting. It. Okay, so simple example is I have a graphic model x and y with no arrow in it. So I have p of x and p of y. Okay. So this is my model, no arrows. I can, if, if X and Y are not independent and I combine these two, then we are double counting. So, yeah. Yes. So the restriction is that, sorry, the restriction is that I want them to be distinct. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't use Dempsey's rule for. Can you use combination? Okay. You have MR. Can wait for can you find Correct. You get this, but but you don't get something that's meaningful. 
right? So um, if X and Y are X and Y are not independent, just finding marginals of X and marginals or combining them, you can always combine it. But you can get something meaningful. The answer is not fine. I can understand it. Y given X or Y given X. Correct. So the equation will be successively assume that X has some value, gave you a value from Y, and X has some value. Right. That's what you prevent. How do we have the same idea? Well, okay, so you're right. So, um, so what do you do with the CPD, right? The, okay, this this tells us about the condition that is vacuous, but then you want to use this, this condition on the model. And the point is that if I um, if I can only combine this with with, with other conditionals that are distinct. So it, it, it imposes the condition that you know you just you can't just combine things randomly. So you're assuming some independence. All right. So in this example, you can you know I, I can combine combine this and get a model. But if if, if, if I don't satisfy the independence condition, then I get some data. So it's not a question of just having CPDs, but to combine them eventually. If you get something meaningful, fine. So, um, and a question is, you know, where do conditions come from? In practice, we build conditions. So where do they come from? So one one source of conditionals is so Phyllis Metz defined uh, this notion. It's called by he didn't call it the Glenn Schaefer called his process. Conditional embedding, and Philip was not happy with this notation. <laughs> with lens terminology here. Yeah. So here, here's sort of a, how we do this, right? It's really simple. Suppose when I know X is X, I have a BPA for Y, which I denote by Y M Y subscript X, that represents our conditional knowledge of Y in the context of X equal to X. Okay. So when X is X, I have a knowledge about Y here. Yeah. Uh, this is not a conditional, it's conditional knowledge, but not conditional in my sense because this, this domain is just Y. <laughs> okay, so what you do is we take this, we take this conditional knowledge. Uh, the knowledge of Y included in M Y subset X is only valid for the case X equal to X. M Y X is not a condition. So by using this conditional embedding, we convert the BPA M Y of X for Y to a conditional M Y given X, my notation here. For x, y, as follows. So we take each focal element B of m, y, x, which is um, this B is a, a space is just a y here. So we correspond to co corresponding focal element of corresponding focal element like this. When x is true, we have B, but when x is not true, we are we got everything. We know nothing, right? So this is so with the same mass. So basically, we take the m, y, x, B, and we convert it to the, the the value is the same, but we this is a, a focal element of y of x and y. So when x when x is true, b is true. When x is not true, we know nothing. That's the idea behind this uh, embedding. It's committed. Um, it's conditioned by x. So yeah, yeah. I mean, so that was uh, Philip's uh, Philip's logic for doing this. Yes. So this, all right. Here I just explain what it is. <laughs> You're right. This is a, to relate to relate to my yeah. To, you're right. This is sort of the least committed. Uh, why the question is why do we do this? So, yeah. And this conditional has as has the following properties. First of all, m y given x, like I defined here, it's a condition for y given x. Uh, so in the sense that if I take uh, the marginal, I get vacuous. And the second thing is, you know, if I take this conditional and combine it with m x equal to x. So m x equal to x is a deterministic BPA, where you know I know x is equal to one. X equal to x has mass one. Then if I take this, if I combine this with this, and then find the marginal, I will get back my 
I think I started. Okay. So this conditional, I add the knowledge that x equal to x. So I get something on x and y. I, I then margin, find the marginal for y. I get back where I stop. So basically, it does what we wanted to do. Here's an example. Um, so x and y variables there are you know, x, x bar, and y, y bar. And when x is true, m, y, x, there is 80% mass on y, just y, and the 20% on, on y and y bar. So as I said, this is conditional knowledge, but it's not a conditional in my, in my, in my sense. So basically, I want to make it a conditional. So I take this. Um, so when x is true, it's y. So x is, when x is true, it's y. But when x is not true, I put y and y bar. So this point A the, is assigned to this uh, state space of xy. And uh, you know, for this one, if I do the same thing, I get everything. So basically, it's point two. So this is sort of the, this is one source of condition. This is a conditional in the sense I defined. I'll show you. So this is to satisfy. So basically, um, if I take this this conditional here, I I drop x. So this is y and y bar. So point it goes to y y bar. This also goes to y y bar. So basically, it's it's a vacuous. Um, if I remove, sorry, I'm removing y here. So x and x bar here, and x and x bar. So basically, this is vacuous for x. If I combine, for example, this conditional with the knowledge that x equal to x. So here we have x is equal to x. Now remember, we are combining on two different spaces, so we need to do this vacuous extension that we really talked about. So x becomes x y and x y y. So this is mass one here, and this is this is. If I take the intersection of these two, I get so this is my joint here. So I have eighty percent mass on x y and two twenty percent. Sorry, yeah, and twenty percent chance on x. If I marginalize this to y. I will get what I started with. What I, I, I get back what I what I started with. Yes. Which is this one. This is what I started with. So basically. I put this in so I can explain them so this is not clear. Example of Nexus. Okay, so now I will talk about uh, the next topic is this is greater graphical models. So basically, a directed graph is a pair, you know, uh, G is B, B is a set of variables, set of nodes, and E is a set of directed edges, Xi, Xj, between two distinct variables. And I need the notion of parents. So for any node X in V, let parents of X in G denote the parents of X in G. Basically, the set of all Y and V such that Y, X, we have an edge, Y, X, and E. Um, So a directed graph is said to be acyclic. So we need the graph to be acyclic in the sense that if and only if there exists a sequence of nodes in the graph, for example, one example of sequence x1 to xn, such that if there's a directed edge xi, xj, and e, then xi must precede xj in the sequence. Um, and I'll do an example here. And this this sequence is called a topological sequence. It depends only on the on the topology of the graph. It doesn't depend on anything else. And this sequence may not be unique. Um, see, I have I could I would make an example. So this this is a, a, a directly cyclic graph. So the nodes are the variables, and then we have um, one sequence. For example, is uh, you know W uh, L F, and this sequence sort of is now if since an arrow from W to F, F must follow W, and so on and so forth, right? So A is sort of a, uh, A is the last one here because it has arrows from D to S and so on. So okay. So anytime there's an arc like M to R, M, M should, uh, R should follow M. The okay, R always comes after M. And this is only possible if you say cyclic. If I have a cycle, then you can't find uh, a sequence like this. So a graph is a cyclic if and only if there exists a sequence. Um, let's see, let me. So here's the definition of a uh, directed acyclic graph. Um, sorry, a, a definition of a belief function directed graphical model. 
So we were directed a cyclic graph G and a, a, a model. So a belief function directed graphical model is a pair G with a set of the set of uh, PPAs M1 of the MN such that BPA MI associated with node XI is a conditional BPA for XI given the parents of parents of XI. A fundamental assumption of this is that, that these are distinct, which then corresponds to, so basically since they're distinct, I can all combine them all, and this is my joint. So the assumption that these are distinct allows the combination in this part. So this is only allowed if all they are distinct. This is why I want to, this is why I want to impose a condition of independence there. So basically, um, <clears throat> What this means is sort of, so I give you a definition of independence. The definition of independence basically uh, says that, you know, if given M, the joint BPA by defined here in equation five, it follows from the definition of independence that suppose I have a, a topological sequence, X1 to Xn, this graph, since it's a cyclic that exists a topological sequence. For each Xi, I going from two to N, Xi is independent with respect to this joint of all the previous variables in the sequence given its parents. It's given the, so basically, given the parents of Xi, Xi is independent of all the other variables that preceded. Okay. Let's see, let me say it in words. Each variable Xi is independent of the variables that come before it given its parents. And of course, I go to, I, since there are, they have to be all distinct. The variables have to be disjoint. The sets of variables have to be disjoint. We have to remove this. Okay. So, for example, here in this example here, so W, there's an error from W to F in the sequence. Uh, so there is um, no independence assumption. Assumption. Let's let, let's take A for example. Let's take this A. A is the last one, and its parents are D and S. So basically, it's saying that uh, A is independent of all other variables given D and S. Okay. I can do this for every variable. So I, I think I've done it. A, A is independent of given D and S. A is independent of all other variables. So, so. Question, yeah. So for S, for example, if I take S, um, S, S's parents are R and W. And so S is independent of all the variables that come before it, given given uh, R and W. Given R and W, S is independent of all the all the other variables. Okay. So this is sort of the the. I mean, this can be easily shown. I mean, what I just told, uh, what I just told you. It follows from the definition of independence. It also follows from the fact that you know I, uh, yeah. We come down to it, for example, W, uh, w and L, for example, there's no independent assumption there because it's complete here. It's a complete graph. Okay. So I told you about um, the directed graphical model. So I'll tell you about undirected graphical model. You have a question? Yeah. So it's a uh, So uh, when the point is that if, if I have this, if I, sorry, if I call this a model, then you're automatically assuming this independence condition. All of the conditions, I just haven't put them all, I put et cetera there. So um, this model consists of these assumptions, this independent assumption. And this, this, these independent assumptions are a result of having conditionals. That is, um, but the Bayesian network is not really. Uh, so the graph and really based on those only. Yes. So the yes, position yes. gives you. Uh, that also by yes, absolutely. Yes. So I'll talk about this example here. This example is from 
this is a vessel arm as captain's problem. Yeah. So yes. What is this? the question? Is what is the source of independence? And it's it's, it's causation. It's one source. So I will talk about non-directed graph models, undirected graph tool model. Here, you know, the same sense here. Basically, I have undirected graph with nodes and edges. Edges are put, I put a curly back. There is no direction there. X i is just an edge. And then we know we need the notion of a Markov boundary of x i. So the Markov boundary of x i, so m a of x i in G, is basically all the all the nodes are like connected to x i. Um, so now, in words, mark a boundary of x i is a set of nodes in V that are directly connected to x i. Okay. A clique is a maxim, maximal completed connected, completely connected subset of nodes. That's what a clique is. It has to be maximum. And we assume there are k cliques in G, which is different from, so uh, k is always smaller than R. Um, and here's an example. So I have two examples here. So in this this model, uh, they're all cliques here. So each each edge is a clique. Okay, because it's completely connected and it's maximum. We can we can find a bigger one. That's, but in this example here, uh, an edge is not a clique because we have a bigger a bigger set. This is a clique and this is a clique. Okay, because they are. So this 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 graph has two cliques. This graph has four cliques. Okay. Um, so here's the definition of an undirected graphical model. So basically, uh, we have undirected. Suppose we have R clicks, R one to R k, which is going to be less than the number of uh, nodes. So a belief function undirected graphical model is a pair G with a with a variable associated with each click m one to m k, such that the BPA m i associated with the click is the BPA for R i. A fundamental assumption of a, of a uh, undirected graphical model is that these are all distinct, and the joint BPA is associated with the tensor combination of, of all all the BPAs. And so, the assumption of distinctness allows us to combine these things. And again, from my definition of traditional independence, you can show that what is the, what is the assumption of an undirected graphical model? So each xi is given the Markov boundary of xi. Uh, xi is independent of all other variables, okay. all the rest. So given Markov boundary xi, Markov boundary of xi, xi is independent of all, all the other variables. So I can give you an example here. So for this, I'll use the same two examples. Here. So I have x1, x2, x3, x4. So I have uh, m1, m, m1, 2 for x1, x2, with domain x1, x2, m2, 3, x, etc. We have these four belief functions. So my joint on, on this for this graph, the joint is of this themselves combination of all these four, um, assuming they're all distinct. So basically, this graph has two independence conditions. Um, x1 is independent of x3 given given x2, x4. This is and uh, x2 is independent of x4 given x1, x3. So there are these two conditions here. And they follow from the factorization of the joint, right? I can take this fact, this particular factorization, uh, M12, M14, and you know, and M23, M34. And uh, you can see that uh, the domain X2, X4, they're common. X2, X4 is in both, both of the domains here. So given X2, X4, uh, you know, X1 is in the kind of X3. Okay. And if I rewrite this, if I rewrite the joint, I can show I can show that this graph, this x given x1, x3, x2 is independent x4. Yes. Correct. So on that there are four cliques. Correct. So it's really only four mass functions. No, there are only there you have four mass functions. Correct. That's right. We have four clicks that are each of the edges, okay. and each edge is, is is associated with the with the mass function. Correct. On on the right hand side here, um, 
So let M denote there are only two clicks, so there are only two mass functions. The subscript denote the, 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 the domain. There's only one independent assumption here, which is X2 and X2 and X4 are, are, are independent given every, everybody else, which is X2, X3. This is of course follows from just product of this. It follows from here because what is common in the what is common in the domain of these two mass functions is one three. So given one three, x is independent x four. Okay. Yes. I is for each click. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. The mass with each edge, M on two. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so um so one example of a of an undirected graph model, this is called communication network. And you can see this is large, you can make it as large as you want, right? So basically uh, each node is a each node is a communication node, and the links to tell, tell you physically how they're connected. And uh, basically, there are also two nodes, A and B. And you know, we know what the reliability of each node is. And the question is, what is the reliability uh, of the link uh, of between A and B? So I, 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 can, I can combine. So basically, there are 29 communication nodes plus two more. So there are 31 communication nodes here. They're all binary. There are 44 undirected graphs here. The reliability of each of these links is 90%, but A and B there are, is only relevant 80%. The question is, what is the, what's the reliability of uh, between A and B? And you know, it, it, you can make this very large, <laughs> and you can compute this very quickly. By I will tell you how. Okay. It turns out that the reliability of A and B is, is about 64% approximately, because there are so many so many edges between A and B, so many paths between A and B that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, let's see. Hope I haven't spent too much time. So the question is, you know, how do we compute? How do we do this local compute? How do we compute the margin? So to explain this, I went, I, I go through this example here. This is called captain's problem. In the interest of time, I can skip this. Um, how are we doing respect to time? It's we start at eleven fifteen. A break, soft break, but maybe only five minutes, or maybe you want long ten minutes. <laughs> Break and have five minute break. And yeah, we'll take a five minute break. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
I think I'll quickly go through this example. So this is called captain's problem. You know, question is, the main question is, you know, how many days the ship is going to be delayed? Uh, and so there is two of the delays as arrival delay and this departure delay. The arrival delay is, um, sorry, how many days? Yeah, the arrival delay is composed, decomposed into delay in departure and delay in sailing. Leaves late from starting point or delays and route because of bad weather or fair at sea. And no, yes, you know, the maintenance can be done or not. If maintenance is done, then so the maintenance will delay uh, departure and uh, re repair at sea will delay um, sailing, uh, repair at sea will delay. And then delay Sailing delay causes building. And then he has a weather forecast. This is this, this, this is a weather forecast. The forecast is ready for survival. So basically, so um, so these are the variables that we have. There are eight variables here. Um, so these these are not the, the rest are all binary, but these are just how many days. Um, this is sort of the graph I showed you earlier. So basically. So this is a causal graph in the sense that the actual weather causes weather forecast, not, not the other way around. And you know, the departure delay is caused by um, this bad weather forecast will delay it by a day. If there's loading delay, not everything is loaded, he'll, he'll, it gets, gets delayed. And maintenance, this has to do maintenance, it will cause a delay. So this, so this is exactly a causal model. This is the source of condition independence. Maintenance, um, uh, whether do you do maintenance or not causes this um, repair at sea. Repair at sea is caused by whether you did maintenance. If you don't eat into maintenance, then it's more likely that you need to do repair at sea when you're sailing. And sailing delay is caused by repair at sea or the actual weather. The actual weather is bad. Um, yeah. And, and so, so, so anyway, so these are, so I have this, this, this bipartite graph I showed you earlier. And this is, you know, here's an example of, uh, okay, I, I have a, Conditional for a given d. Yes, this graph tells me I have a, I have a conditional of for a given its parents are d and s. I have a conditional for a given d. And this and this is and this conditional is actually deterministic. Okay, so this is um, a is a, the first is the sum of this, these two. Okay, so if say a, a departure delay is zero and and filling delay is zero, then arrival delay is zero. So a is equal to d plus s. It's a deterministic relation. So I only have one focal element in this one. And it's a conditional why? Because if I remove the if I remove the first the first digit in all of this, I get something that's vacuous. Every possibility is listed. <coughs> Every possibility for uh, DNS are included. So that's why it's such a conditional. Okay, it's vacuous. That's what I said, right? Okay. So, um, and so, so I'm going to skip most of this. So, this is here is an example of uh, oh, this is uh, I don't want. I'll, I'll skip all this. I want to get to the main point. So, uh, how do we compute? In, make how do you make inferences, right? We can't compute the joint. So, as I said, making inference means finding the margin of the joint variables of interest, and we will do this by using local computation. So, uh, so let's so we start with this model here. Uh, I want to I want to compute the marginal of this for arrival delay, which means I could remove all, all the other variables. From this network, okay. Now look at L. Suppose I decide to remove L first. I'll tell you why later. Why L? But you can you can do anything actually. It doesn't matter. We get the same answer. Suppose consider it's only in the domain. So L is only in the domain of uh, delta and lambda. Look at the uh, this is lambda is and delta, uh, okay. So if I want to remove L for my local computation axiom, so if I if I remove, if I combine delta and lambda, and I remove L from it, then I know, so my model has changed now. Okay, if I, if, if I combine this with all the other, which, which I didn't change, I will get the marginal. This is follows from the, Local computation axiom. This L is only in uh, delta and lambda. L is not in the other variables. Okay. So 
So I'm, I want to remove L from the joint here. So I, I, I do, I, I make this operation here. I combine Delta and L. So basically I end up with a model like this now. L is gone here and L has been replaced. Uh, so L is gone and this Delta plus Lambda have been combined because L is in both of them and I remove L from it. Okay. So I've been, I, I managed to remove L. So I recursively do this. Is this clear? So L is only in the domain of uh, Delta and Lambda. So I got to combine these two. I can, you know, I combine these two and remove L from it. So L is gone now. Okay. I just recursively repeat this. Now, suppose I want to remove W. It's the same logic. Suppose I want to remove W. <coughs> w is in the domain of uh, sigma and phi. So I basically um, take combine phi and uh, sigma and remove W from it. And you know, I get, I get, I get a, a new, a, a new BPA for this, for this domain. So it looks like that now. Okay. Remember, the rule is uh, when you want to remove a variable, uh, you have to combine everything that has that variable. Okay. It's not in anything else. So basically, why? Because I, it can be of the rest. Okay. So I have this model now. So I just recursively do this. So. <clears throat> Now, okay. Uh, now, after so after I remove L and W, I, I have these things. Um, as you see, when I combine things, things get bigger, right? So, factors. Okay. So, if I remove R, and the recursively I do, I remove R. So, going back here, R uh, is in the domain of uh, row two, row one, and and this. I have to combine these things and remove R from it. So, I get something like that. <laughs> And I proceed. Um, and basically, I get, I get this. this, this uh, it's a long BPA, but it's, it's, it's a big, it's all domain, domain, domain is only here. So it's not, not that big. Okay. So this is sort of the, this is the marginal of the joint. Okay. So we have the marginal for it. Okay, so we use one particular sequence here. L, I removed L first and then W and then R and everything. So the order does not matter, allows us to use any sequence. Okay. We get the same answer regardless of sequence. But some deletion sequences are better than others in the sense that they, they involve less work. You want to do as little work as possible um, so you can compute quickly. Now finding an optimal sequence is a hard problem. Uh, so you don't want to spend too much time, right? If you want to go home and you want to take a shortcut, you, you, don't, you don't want to spend two hours just trying to find a shortcut. <laughs> you just, whichever path you pick. So, so the, you use heuristics. And one heuristic that's commonly used is called one-step look-ahead. Is remove the variable that involves the least amount of work. <laughs> so if you have a variable that's only in one valuation, you can remove it without doing any combination. So you can remove it and so on and so forth. Okay. And so uh, all of this is implemented in, in a software called belief function machine that Philippe and Thierry and I were in. It was done by Fan Zhang. Fan Zhang was a student at uh, right now. Um, he's at George Mason University right now. Okay, so if you can find the marginal for a variable, for A, for example, then we can find the marginal for any variable. Right? I just repeat this. I remove, I want to find the marginal for S, for example, I can remove everything except X. But if I do it, you know, for each one, I'm, I'm duplicating a lot of things. So the question is, uh, if you want multiple marginals, is that a shortcut? Okay. Is that, can you avoid some computations? The answer is yes. So we can uh, save some computations by uh, saving uh, intermediate computations in a, in a structure called a joint tree. So what is the, what's the joint tree? A joint tree is a tree with subsets of variables and nodes with the property that if a variable appears in two different nodes, it appears in all nodes in the path between. So here is a, so this is my first computation I did. So I wanted to remove L. So L is in here, L is in here. So basically when I combine these two, I get this domain. 
this is the union of the two, and then I remove you know, right? Okay, so this is already the same as this. So we can take a little, you know, I, I, I can I can say, well, I can just merge this two and say, you know, I have this thing left now. So basically, one way to do this computation is to explain that um, L has lambda on it. This has delta with delta associated with it. And then, you know, this sends a message here. So I'm describing this as a message passing. <clears throat> L sends a message to this node. And this combines what it has and what it gets, and then it finds sends it to this. Okay, so this is like this is this thing. Okay. All of it, the union of these two minus it minus L. So I can describe this computation as just message passing. <laughs> so I can do the same thing here. So this is the fragment of the network that I describe when I remove W. So W is in here. W is in here. And this is the union of the two. <laughs> so. This has phi with it. This is sigma. This has nothing. So this sends a message. So there's no modulus because this, this, is a, this is a superset. This is a superset. No. And then this sends a message here, which is there is no W here. So it has to marginalize. Okay. So when you send a message, it has to make sense to the sender, to the receiver. So I'm describing the same thing, but I'm describing it as a message passing metaphor. Okay. So this is sort of, so here is the deletion of argument described like this. Um, and so implicitly when I, by using this sequence, I, I have now arrived at, this is a joint read. And what sense, what's a joint read? Because uh, uh, no, L, L is in here, L is in here, and L cannot be any, anywhere else. <laughs> now L, when I, combine, when I remove L, I need to combine everything that has L in it. So, so L is only 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 in these two and nowhere else. Okay. So the joint tree. So basically, if I have if I have, for example, W is here and W is here, then it has to be uh, everywhere, you know, on all, yeah. If there are if there are if, you know, um so the 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 property that this tree satisfies is if a variable is in two nodes, it has to be in every node that connects them. Okay. If if uh, M, for example, M, uh, M is here, uh, M is here, so it has to be uh, on all the nodes connecting this. Because when, when we remove something, we have to combine everything that has M and stuff like that. So that's the logic. So this is called a joint tree. Um, so what do we do with the joint tree? So we, 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 uh, we send messages. So basically, um, we orient all edges towards A, which is now called the root of the tree. And each node sends its message to the inward neighbor. Um, and of course, when you send a message, it has to make sense. So you have to marginalize it appropriately. And timing, the timing is, you know, you can send a message to your, to your inward neighbor until you have received messages from your outward neighbor. So this is sort of the, the process is finished when the root has received a message. So here's a sort of a, <clears throat> so I started at the beginning. At the beginning, you know, I, I haven't said anything. All I have is, you know, uh, lambda is associated with L, delta with this, and et cetera, et cetera. So the, uh, in the next slide, I have um, time step one, uh, H L sends a message to this node, lambda, what it has, and there's no marginalization because this is super set of that, okay? So in time step one, lambda is sent from this node to this node. In time step two, well, nobody else, um, yeah. I mean, actually in time step one, this can also send a message because uh, this sends a message phi here and this sends a message sigma here, but all the other nodes cannot, this cannot send a message because it hasn't received a message from its outward neighbor. So this has to wait until it gets this, then it can send a message. So in, in time step two, now I know more, there are more messages being sent. Now this has gotten a message from L, so it can now send um, this, mark, this, this has to marginalize it because this, this the smaller subset and so on and so forth. Okay. So in time step two, I have this, this additional messages. Uh, and so in time step three, I can send more messages now because now this one has received a message which it didn't have in the earlier step. And so, so I continue with this until um, until we have a message um, sent to A. So this is the final message that is being sent. And this is the marginal that we computed. So I've described this, this um, as message passing. Why? Because 
Now, suppose I'm interested in another marginal. Now, suppose we want to find the margin for L. Okay. So, one thing we can do is we can reorient uh, some edges. So, L is a run. L is a root, so we make L the root in this joint tree uh, and compute the messages. So basically, um, so now L is the root, for example. So you notice that you know the only arrows that I change direction. So now L, L has to be the root. So I have to just um, I compare this with the previous uh, with the previous tree. So L is the root. So some of this uh, mess, some of these arrows had to be re reoriented because arrows are going towards L now. So those those uh, these arrows don't blink. So this other arrows has to be redirected. Um, so you know the, the bolded arrows are the ones that have changed, or the, or the other ones didn't change. And so the, those are the only new messages that I have to compute. Okay, because then the messages, so I, I need to recompute. So I have the same discipline here. So basically, there's there's nothing here. Sorry. Um, there's nothing here, nothing here. So basically, to this, um, there's nothing, nothing to send here. So alpha, x, a is alpha. This node has alpha in it, and when it sends a message, it has to remove, remove a. So if you notice that, you know, the only new messages that are being computed are these on this side. So there's nothing here. So these are all the things that were not there before. So all the other ones we don't have to redo because we already have them. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, I will come come to that. Eventually, I will do even something simpler. <laughs> but basically, the, I, I say the messages. Because the messages have been computed, they're, they're stored in memory. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so basically, so this is, so, you know, um, previously I had, so each edge, so these are the, these are the messages, messages associated with, with that direction. It turns out if I want to, I can find the marginal for every variable in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the model, like by twice the cost of, twice the cost of finding uh, one marginal. Because I, I do a message in, in, in each direction. So for the cost of finding two marginals, I can compute the marginal for of every every for every row system. Um, okay, the, the theory behind this why it works is the local competition action. Um, yeah. Um, so this is the last part uh, application. So, so as I said, uh, we talked about belief function machine. This is an implemented in MATLAB, but it's in it's in the process of being ported to R. Uh, apparently, it's all been done except for the. For the this is Wakla Washek doing it in Czech Republic. It was written in two thousand two by Fan Jiang under the supervision of Philippe Thierry and I. And in uh, 2003, it was further developed where Sushil as my daughter, she was home for the summer. She was uh, finished her freshman year. Uh, she was a computer science major. And so she did, she implemented the honey lemon shortcut where uh, you can do, you can make, um, you can, when you do Dempster's rule, it turns out that much of the, um, when you when the models are large, there's a lot of uh, local elements with very small, very very small, very small uh, values. And if you throw them out, <laughs> you can make the thing very fast. So, um, so how does this work? So basically, there is no graphical interface. So basically, you have a text file called UIL for some language, and we can solve really large models. And by large, I mean really more large. <laughs> If you pick that's a default value for what you throw away. That that's a limit. Anything smaller than that, you you keep. If you want to, if you want to keep everything. You you make that ten to the minus twelve. But if you want to make it faster, the model is so big that it takes a long time. Then you increase that value. 
from 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 6 or things like that. It runs really fast. Um, and you can download it free from, from this website. Um, this includes the document, includes documentation. So suppose we want to solve this captain's problem. So you know, the nice thing about this is it does um, conditional embedding automatically. You don't have to do conditional embedding. So, so here is a snippet. Basically, we have we define variables, the name of the variable and its state space, etc. And then we define the relations can be now. So these are you know these are defined relations, and there's also defined conditional relation. If we have a defined relation, it's all it's already a condition, so you don't have to do anything. And if you don't have, if you want to do conditional embedding, you you, you say it's called it a conditional. And so, so define relation. This is the name of the relation, and this is the domain of the relation. And then you define the valuation here. Okay. So in this case, there's only one focal element value one. Um, you can also define conditional valuation. So this is not a conditional, but it will be convert to a conditional by doing like that. The system will do it. And so basically, this is given m. So um, given t, if 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 um, M is maintenance. If maintenance is true, then then this is my belief function for R. So you do all this, and then you this is this is what you do, right? So you say, well, UIL to BM. So take this UIL file and construct a, a belief uh, a MATLAB uh, object that you call BM captain, and then you have this this thing make it all global. And then you first you um, do conditional embedding. You say conditional embed um, all all the belief functions. So when the ones that are already conditionals, that are not conditionals, it leaves them alone. Once that are conditional, it, it uh, does conditional embedding. And then you say, well, throw away everything else, but keep just keep what you have just done. <laughs> so you don't combine, you know, to keep distinctness, you need to throw away everything else. And then uh, solve it and show me the bell. So it does this. <laughs> and, you know, so the question is, what do we get, right? So we get a, a belief function uh, on A. That's really big. Um, I think I have a something. Well, that's really big because A has um, six possibilities: zero to five, zero, one to three, four, five. So that has um, uh, sixty-four. Uh, sixty-four. Uh, so if you're interested in interested in one proposition, what's the probability? What's the chances that my delay is two days, for example? Then you can compute the marginal. You can use the same system and find the marginal, and then you get belief in possibility. So you get bounce on it. If you want, if it's sort of another another way to summarize it is to sort of say, well, um, reduce this belief function to a probability. So then you get a distribution, okay. a, a probability mass function, and this is done by by plausibility, yeah. possibility. So in the, in this case, you get the idea that you know two days is the most likely, most likely it has twenty percent chance. So. Anyway. So, um, if, you know, if the nice thing about this is a belief is a, is a generalization of probability. <clears throat> so if you have a Bayesian network, then you can put this into the software and it will, it will solve it and get exactly the same answers as Yugen or something else. <laughs> um, so why do we need this question is, why do we need belief functions, belief function graphical models? And the answer is that a Bayesian reasoning can only a reason with complete knowledge. Okay. If you're missing like some priors or some conditions, you cannot reason with, 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 with base rule. I mean, if you don't know a prior, so put maximum likelihood prior or maximum entropy prior, then it gives you the final uh, condition is, is a point estimate. It hides, it doesn't tell you what it doesn't know, like chatbot, right? Um, Whereas if you do a belief, if you leave out the uh, belief points that are missing, then you don't get a Bayesian belief function at the end. You get a non-Bayesian belief function and you can compute the marginals and then you get belief and possible. So the belief function model tells you more precisely what you know given the knowledge you have. Bayesian reason cannot do that. Turns out that even if you do sensitivity analysis on the missing priors, <laughs> You get you get much narrow uh, much narrow uh, uh, fit of the of the so you, there is no escape from using the 
Anyway, so this is so this is my model. You can actually solve it and get exactly the same answers as Bayesian network. And this is a you know this is a grid. Uh, this is the communication network. Um, so basically, uh, you know, the script here, and I get, as I said, it's about 64%. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, oh these are all the CPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Correct, but they are equivalent. I mean, you, you're right. In the belief function case, I can, I can. This is a deterministic knowledge. Yeah, yeah. But I don't, I don't do a, I don't. It turns out that if you do conditional embedding and combining like this, then you get exactly the same. Answer. Same. Sorry. So there's no need to. You don't. As I said, Smith's conditional embedding is one way to get condition, not the only. And then that you can actually make this. Uh, you can make this network as big as you want. This is what Hani Lehman did to show the power of their. Uh, and this is all implemented in. So actually, even without without making something like this, uh, it takes belief function machine a, a second or two to do it. But of course, if you if we you know instead of having, I don't know, I have uh, twenty nine nodes here. If I have hundred nodes, then it will take a few seconds, and you can make it faster by just changing one parameter in, in the model. <laughs> In practice, we're never, we're, never, we're never interested in, you know, more than few few decimal places here, right? Who's interested in knowing the second third? So you can you can throw away everything that's. And Honey Lemon has they 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 give you bounds on how accurate the answer. It was very nice, uh, really nice piece of work, and it's all been implemented in. And the references. So this all the so VBS is I did this. Uh, in 89, conditional independence was done in 94. This is more recent conditional belief functions. <laughs> it was presented last year at, uh, at, at the belief function conference. Um, local competition was done a long time ago, with man. This is, goes back to 1990. So actually, um, this is the Axiom's paper, but our, our method for finding was done in 87, it precedes the Lawrence and Spiegel adoption, which, which happened in 88, the published in 88. So the, there's a paper by, uh, by Len, uh, myself, and Meluli uh, propagating belief functions for the system. It was done earlier, earlier than. Of course, after Pearl, Pearl was the first one to do it. And this Captain's Volume is an Alman's book, really nice book on practical belief uh, models. But you know, not all is, you know, the way uh, Almond defines conditionals is awkward. <laughs> um, he has an idea of a joint, but in practice, you don't have a joint. So um, this is a, the Lords and Spiegel order paper, paper that has this just an example. And you know, this this is an interesting. Again, as I said, <clears throat> why do you need uh, why do you need uh, belief function models? Is I mean in practice, you never have complete complete information. If you don't have complete information, just making them up and treating in, in a Bayesian way hides what you don't know. <laughs> you, because if you, you get point estimates for everything. You don't know what you don't know. It's kind of a little dangerous when you practice, when you, you use it in practice. The nice thing about belief functions is we get into belief in possibilities. And this is the Honey, Honey Lehman paper uh, approximating property. That's all I have to say. Sorry to keep on my <laughs>